So we've talked a lot about the periodic table already, and you should know many of the patterns that show up in the periodic table. You should know about how the atomic numbers change throughout the periodic table, and that's basically going to be towards the right side and towards the bottom. So that's the general point of increase of the, of the pattern there. And you also have the pattern of periods, which are basically every period is a, is a different row. So as you go down the periods, you increase the shells. As you go towards the columns are actually the number of electrons in the last shell, excluding, of course, the D block and the F block elements. So if you exclude those, the other columns are going to be increasing the number of valence electrons on the last shell. Now, you also have the period, the families. Remember, each family are, is one vertical column, which represents a group of elements that with similar characteristics, either because they're in the same metal family or because they're in the same number of valence electrons on the last shell. We also talk about the size patterns. We talked about that the elements will increase towards the bottom because of new valence shells which are added, and they will also increase towards this side because elements on the right side will have large numbers of protons for the same number of shells, which means that those shells are going to be closed up more since they have more protons. So fluorine will be the smallest of the second row elements because that second shell is going to be inwards more because of more protons, more attractive force of the nucleus is being exerted on the electrons. We, so that the overall pattern of increase of atom size will be like this. And again, the D block and the F block elements are going to be excluded from this particular pattern. You also have the patterns of valence, which we talked about already, and valence orbitals. Remember, the first two are going to be the S blocks, and then you're going to have the D block over here, and then you're going to have the P block over there, and then you're going to have the F block over here. And these are the orbitals at which the last uh, layers actually are going to be ending up. All right, so these are what we call the blocks which finish the layers of the atom. We also talk about the electrogenerative activity, which has everything to do with how hungry you are for electrons. And the people on the right side are close to noble gases, so they're going to be hungry for to take electrons. So electrogenerative activity will tend to increase like that, especially among the smaller atoms, which are more desperate because since they have less um, electrons. So for them, electrons mean a lot. And then you also have the opposite pattern, which is being metal-like. And metal-like means to be willing to give them up. And so that means people on the left side will be more metal-like, and therefore, especially the large ones, which won't even notice if an electron goes missing. The smaller ones might be thinking about it twice, since they don't have a lot of electrons. So metallic nature increases towards like this, towards this corner of the periodic table. Which means that overall, the reactivity pattern of the periodic table will be larger towards the sides, Okay, because those will be the ones which will be more likely to give and receive. And on this side, these will be the most reactive, the top. And on this side, the bottom will be the most reactive, which means this group right here and that group right there are the most reactive groups of the periodic table. Remember, remember of course, that the, the noble gases on the extreme right side have zero reactivity altogether because they have completed clouds and they do not like to react. Then we also talked about the different groups of the periodic table. We talked about... The alkaline metals, which are very reactive. Alkaline earth metals, which are a little less reactive. Then we talked about the rare earth metals, which are the lanthanide series. The uh, radioactive-like uh, metals, which are the actinide series. We talked about the transition elements of the D-block elements, which are metals, or the famous metals are mostly here. We talked about the post-transitional, or weak metals, which I included around there. We we'll also talk about the metalloids, which sometimes act like, like metals, and sometimes they act like like uh, um, the non-metals. Then we talked about the non-metals, and then we talk about the the actual halogens, which are extremely reactive, and the alkali counterparts in terms of electrical activity. And then finally, the noble gases, which are not reactive at all. And to see this pattern is a little bit better. I'm going to show you this picture one, once again. And you see the family's picture over there. Okay? And now, the, just a few more things to finish out the thing. States of matter. Now, this is not actually a pattern. I just want to show you uh, a, a, something that will visualize the states of matter in the periodic table. As you can see, most of the elements that are occurring in nature are going to be solid. And those are the ones picture in yellow. The ones pictured in blue are the only ones that show up as liquids, and that's going to be 
you can easily to remember that's going to be the mercury and bromide. Everything else is going to be solid. And then you have the gases. And the gases include all the nonmetals of the top, the most reactive elements in the PRA table. Fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine. All right, the reactive family there, the most reactive group. And all the, the noble gases plus hydrogen gas as well. So you see that, that those will be our most common types of gases which are found. So if you memorize the gases and the liquids, everybody else is solid. So it makes it easier for you to remember. Okay? Now in terms of radioactivity, that means being unstable. These are, in the, the, the more red you are, the more unstable you actually are. Now, actually, something that I forgot to teach you. These atoms are so unstable that every single isotope that exists in nature is unstable. There's not a single isotope of these elements which lasts forever. They all decay over time into smaller elements, which means that uh, there is no way to actually get the average isotope, isotopic mass to get the atomic weight of the atom. So instead of using the weighted average for the atomic weight, you actually use the weight of the most common type of isotope or the most stable isotope as the average atomic uh, mass for the atom. Okay, And you see that there are other elements which are also radioactive. For example, you have nitrogen, carbon, boron, helium, hydrogen, lithium, uh, potassium, iridium, uh, and bromine, chlorine, several which are radioactive as well. And then you have the orange ones, they have several radioactive elements as well, fluorine and so forth. And then you have a few that have no known radioactive elements. So you see that these are the indexes of rel relativity in the periodic table, or how many radioactive isotopes you actually find, or how unstable these elements tend to be. Now notice that the most unstable elements are going to be the larger ones, and that's because they're going to be too big for the strong force to hold that atom together. Now you may be asking yourself, why the hell is this one unstable right there? That has to do with the electrical configuration of the cloud of the atom, and we learn about that when you actually get into advanced chemistry. Okay? Now, another pattern that I also wanted to show you is number of time that this actual radioactive isotopes will actually last. Now, notice that all the ones in pink will actually last less than a day for each half-life of the atom. So, they're very, very unstable. The ones in, like, uh, 10 will last, you know, between a day and thousands of years. The ones in yellow will last between one year and thousands of years. And the ones in green will last between thousands and millions of years. So that's going to be very, very, uh, last very, very long time. Radium, uranium are good examples of that. And then you want to have uh, the elements which last over billions of years. And then you have the stable ones which haven't decayed since they formed, pretty much. And those are the blue ones, okay? If they don't happen to be radioactive, because remember, some of the blue ones, as you saw in the previous picture, are radioactive. So this is talking about the radioactive elements, the ones which are more radioactive, okay? Now, some of these elements are actually what we call quasi-synthetic. Now, these are elements which do show up in nature, but in very trace, minuscule amounts, and so you're not going to find them very often. Plutonium is even one of them. All right, but then you have the ones which are fully synthetic elements or the ones which have only been discovered through actual particle collisions and particle accelerators which forced elements to become close together and fused together into larger elements, the same kind of things that happens in of stars. By the way, stars also uh, create fission of elements. Stars will do both fusion and fission, but overall it's at the fusion of stars which is interesting, which is what makes elements. And we have done the same in particle accelerators. Accelerator atoms towards each other so fast that they actually fuse into larger atoms. And so these are all the elements that we have created in the laboratory, all right? And basically, all atoms between 1 and 98 are going to be naturally occurring. So the first 98 elements will show up in nature. So elements 43, 61, 85, 87, and then 93 through 98 will all natu happen naturally, but in only very trace amount. In fact, we can make more in the lab than we can find it in nature. The other ones, all the way to 118, are going to be 
actual fully synthetic elements which are never found in nature and we call them either transuranium elements and those are going to be right here uranium and the fermium or transferamium elements these three or the transactinide series which are all of this now these are synthetic elements which are never found in actual nature but are actually have to be produced in a laboratory like i just described all right then a total you have about 30 of these which included 10 uh quasi synthetic and the 20 fully synthetic okay uh, but remember 98 will happen naturally but 10 of those are considered to be very very rare to the point that they're almost synthetic okay and now let's talk about the abundance of the elements now this is the overall abundance of elements within a solar system and it's a good representation of what happens in the universe the most common elements are going to be things like hydrogen and helium and then you have the lighter elements at the top of the periodic table to be more of that and then you're going to have a very 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 very, very little of the larger elements especially once you pass iron because those elements are only going to be made by supernova explosions which are not that common in the universe and so and even those elements a lot of them are going to be unstable and are going to decay over time into the lighter elements that you see in the top and that's why you won't see too many of them now in terms of earth's crust you will see mostly things like silicon and oxygen you see how they're very very common on the top side there and you see a lot of the alkaline and alkaline earth metals you see some transition metals some of those radioactive elements and so forth but these are the a, a picture that shows the abundance of elements on the earth's crust okay um then you also have the abundance of elements in your our bodies this will actually show the elements commonly found in the human body now the most important of one of those are going to be carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen sulfur if and we call that chumps okay chumps so remember that and when you go into biology you learn which of the macromolecules of life include which of these elements now in addition to chumps you're going to have chlorine sodium magnesium potassium and calcium as the most common elements of life and then you have the trace elements marked in blue and then the remaining ones are not really very important for life okay and so that rounds up our explanation about a periodic table of elements. Now, there are some different variations of periodic tables of elements. Some people do what it's called a uh, uh, graphic representation of periodic table that actually puts the families like this to show other kinds of relationships between the elements. And that's a very interesting way to put them together. Another type of variation is, is the periodic circle of elements. You see that this way you also see those same kind of families they saw the periodic table. It's actually a very interesting way to, to put it. So there are some alternative ways to put it, but most people will use the very classic periodic table of elements that actually includes this. And most people will actually get this lanthanide and actinide series and list it on the bottom just to make the, the periodic table a little more manageable, like this. All right, so I hope you learned a lot about the periodic table and you're ready for the alien periodic table activities, and I hope that you got fun with that. All right. So we have a few more videos to talk about molecules and compounds and chemical reactions and that, and then we'll be done with this lecture series. You're almost there. See you guys then.